Um, so anyway, yeah, so private industry. So this might be a little unique, but I actually gave it uh, this presentation quite a bit of an academic slant to focus on the fundamental science and chemistry we do uh, in the process of developing solar uh, photovoltaics uh, commercially. But uh, you know, I'm very excited to be here, and thanks all for, for showing up. But um, QPV, uh, my company, I'm a uh, co-founder. So it, QPV resulted from the merger of the company I founded, Prospect Technologies, uh, with 1366 Technologies. Um, got around 250 million total invested. Almost all that's on the silicon side. But 1366 is about that much to the medium for us guys. But the idea being we bring together a low-cost silicon technology and Prospect to make a high-performance um, tandem uh, panel. Now I'm getting to those details. Um, so kind of up front, some acknowledgements. Um, one of the really cool things about this merger, we brought uh, Breakthrough Energy Ventures into the mix. And so that's a local fund. It's a green fund uh, from, from Bill Gates, um, you know, out of Seattle. And uh, they fund a lot of really important uh, clean tech and green tech uh, innovations. And now they're funding for which is pretty cool. Along with First Solar, um, the only thin film uh, solar PV manufacturer in the whole world that I know of. Um, quite successful, um, so by the 2000s, which was a barren wasteland of dead uh, PE companies, and they came out quite victorious with support of Walmart money, wealth and family money, and then Hunt Energy Enterprises, you know, so, you know, we all consume petroleum products, Peter's prime made petroleum products, um, but, you know, taking all that past effort and moving it forward into the future is really important, right, so all the, the, the what we have in terms of resources from the past energy generation technologies, converting that into to resources to generate new technologies to replace those technologies is Shakespearean or something like that, um, but it's super cool. So 1366, I'll talk about this first because this is not really my area of cross-site guy. So briefly on silicon. So Sikorsky or CC silicon, so you make this big long ingot. Um, uh, so anyway, you melt um, silicon and then you draw this big engine out of this bag of silicon. Um, so this is like really, really, really energy intensive, right? So we talk about clean tech these days, not just about cost, like money, right? So you have embedded carbon and embedded energy. And so reducing that is really, really important if you want to have a clean future, right? So it's a bunch of, you know, BS if we think, okay, we make a whole bunch of solar panels and a whole bunch of electric cars and all our problems are solved, right? And they're all full of embedded carbon. We're way off track. Right, so that's extremely important. But not only do we make this big long engine, we cut the ends off, we cut the sides off, and we saw it up. And that saw, uh, saw dust is called curve. Um, so that's all waste. So around what 23% of the silicon goes to scrap. It's recycled, it's reused, but all the energy. So this is like, what is it? Melting point of silicon is 1400 Celsius and change. And so this is higher than 1400. Powering this, uh, this this uh this furnace here to melt the silicon to draw not only that it's in dark environments with vacuum systems involved very 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 energy intensive and 43 percent of that energy then goes in the trash completely gone so this is a big issue this is what drives a lot of the uh perovskite work that we do this is also on the um what was the formerly 1366 technology is curveless I meaning you take a bat of molten silicon just the same then you lift off layer after layer of silicon off the top. This is like, uh, I don't know, like, uh, like, ever made like chocolate pudding or something where it's all gooey inside, which forms a skin on the top. When you pull that skin off, one after the other of the silicon, that makes a wafer. So that is what we call purposeless technology. One step from molten silicon into a wafer. Um, so very, very interesting, right? So all that 43% energy loss saved here. So low embedded carbon, pretty awesome. So now, where I know more oh, about silicon, um, <laughs> frost guy, I know a couple of things. Um, so what what are we doing with frostite? So we've been around since uh, 2013 on the frostite effort since the very beginning, and um, we fully we work on a different technology called bisensitized solar cells and pivoted with frost guys fully around mid 2014. So what we focus on right now post merger is essentially a bifacial metal halide perovskite module. That the ideal application is a four terminal tandem. Um, so that's two, one solar panel, two solar panels mechanically stacked on one another. So high energy photons on the top, low energy photons on the bottom. You get these high efficiencies. I'll get into more details of that later. Um, one of our big claims to fame is we're the first to synthesize what's known as the most stable perovskite material, pure FAPDI3. 
So it's called formamidinium. medinium. So I'll just save you that magazine. It's called FA. So this material, we crystallized it, synthesized it in um, 2015. So a lot, uh, in large part, reads on our differentiation between us and other perovskite sort of companies is that I'm a chemist, I'm an inorganic chemist. And so when I look at the problems here, I approach it through an inorganic chemistry lens. It's like, what would I do? Like, what, I, what do I see based on my knowledge that's, that's wrong with this system? And a lot of people weren't doing that, right? And so I had a, kind of a unique perspective that allowed us to synthesize this material long before anybody else. Most people, I tell them that I made this and they call me a liar. They're like, you can't make it. I'm like, I got data. Um, so PD device durability is where we focus. So we got to very high efficiency, 18 and a half percent efficiency. So that's light power um, conversion efficiency in like 2014, May, 2014. So we got really high efficiency very, very early. Um, so the problem was you make this stuff it just falls apart after testing it. And so we knew that durability was the key. There was something really there, a lot of potential, but it just falls apart. Um, over the process of developing this, we have one of the world's largest patent portfolios, um, the largest in the US, and it kind of fluctuates on who's doing what, but the top four in the world. Um, the 10,000 square foot facility in Dallas, we do all the work, and the approach is lab to fab. I'll get into that more. But basically, anything I do it in the laboratory, because it's like a chemistry type laboratory, means anything you do in there might have this problem. You can't scale it, right? It's just, it's too. I don't know, too laboratory, right? It's just like, it's, just, it's too fundamental. We use only tools and techniques that can be scaled uh, uh, to manufacturing level. And so kind of give you a brief idea of what we're doing. And so we started off, or right now we're working on, uh, sorry, not right now, we already finished that. Durability and efficiency focusing on these 50 millimeter um, lab coupons. That was kind of the critical thing um, through 2019. Right now, currently we're, we're doing scale up and um, transitioning all of the, equipment that we're not comfortable with scaling to something we think that we can scale uh, on a basically six inches, 150 millimeters by 150 millimeter um, small area, or we call a prototype module. And then next year with a few more prove outs and a whole bunch of money, we got to go raise. Uh, we're going to start um, demonstration level manufacturing. So it's a full size manufacturing line. It would be in a plant, but it's just one line instead of multiple lines you need for high capacity. Um, so we'll start producing panels at two meters by 1.2 meters. Um, that hopefully the build out on that will start uh, next year. So what's the value proposition here with Perovskite? Why do we care about Perovskite? So, so one, the Perovskite structure here is uh, in the lower right hand corner. There we go. So that guy. Um, that's Perovskite. So Perovskite is actually a crystal structure. It's not a material. This is a misnomer and it's commonly misused. And that's not what I want to do either. There we go. And so um, there's lots of forms of perovskite. It's kind of the end result. It's a crystal structure, but the material itself comes in various forms. Um, so how do we see ourselves as a revolutionary, uh, low cost, yet high performance printable semiconductor? Those things you can never all say in the uh, same breath before. Like when I worked with OPVs previously, it was a solution process, I could print it. And it was a company called Canarca uh, who was trying to manufacture it. Um, can anybody guess what Canarca is right now? Nowhere, their, their capital and their IP portfolio was bought out by Fleet Bosch or something like that, but the company company failed. Um, they didn't have any efficiency. So it's a printed semiconductor, but it utilizes added manufacturing tools. So added manufacturing, we know what that is. How about 3D printing? It's the same thing, right? So, so added manufacturing means you print what you need where you need it versus subtracting, which is like machine, like a chunk of metal, and I cut off what I don't want. And that all goes in the trash versus additive. Now that's clean tech, that's green tech, because you only use what you need and you don't waste. And so this results in a very low cost, um, so capital expenditure, capex, in terms of materials, right? So we got a printer that prints the perovskite. It doesn't waste anything, right? So the OPEX or operational expenditures are quite low because I'm not wasting any starting materials. Um, the only thing that really costs me anything is flax. So this ends up less than nine cents per watt um, for total capex. And it just coincidentally, the total cost for the, um, for the panel and a very small footprint. So uh, 100 square foot per, me per megawatt, which is about one tenth of what the last plant that first solar built in Ohio in terms of footprint. Very high throughput, all the starting material, this is real critical, like in battery tech, you have to use cobalt, which uh, comes from a, you know, a socially compromised area in Central Africa. And this cobalt can really, it's like blood cobalt. You don't want to use this stuff, right? This is all readily available, carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, lead, iron, it's all readily available, all very, very cheap. 
So the other thing, the other part that's really important is in um, solar panels, people only talk about efficiency, right? So it's 10% efficiency, it's 20% efficiency. It produces 450 watts, 500 watts. It's actually not what's important. What's burning right here, this is not power, this is energy, right? So how, how many electrons can I make over a period of time? So energy density is what's really, really, really important. So in silicon or even uh, cattail, so series six cattail, the latest version of uh, first solar is uh, cadmium telluride solar panels. Um, so this temperature coefficient is negative 0.3 ish um, uh, percent per degree Celsius. So I lose that much efficiency, negative, or lose 0.3 percent efficiency for every degree um, I raise in temperature. So it's 25 C, um, you know, room temperature where I tested, and this thing might be running at 60 C or 70 C, right? Um, so so I, I'm losing a whole bunch of power, of course, today. But perovskite, at least at the smaller scale, this is for the larger scale, is around uh, negative 0.03. Negative 0.05, so on order of magnitude better um, than current technologies in terms of uh, this temperature coefficient. So what does that mean? So the panel, the sun comes up, the panel's outside, the panel gets hot, the efficiency goes down uh, for silicon and perovskite, but it goes down a lot less with perovskite. So I got two panels that are both 20% at the end of the day. The perovskite panel drops a little bit, silicon drops a little bit more. So over the course of the day, when it's collecting uh, photons, it produces a lot more energy than an equivalent silicon panel would. So that's really important. Energy is energy is key. Um, mentioned some on the first slide there. Talked about there's some kind of cool things about perovskite. One of the really neat things that no other semiconductor can do is I can do small, small chemical substitutions and change the photoelectric properties. Uh, it's really kind of cool. So this is a really old paper from uh, Giles Epperon. He's kind of one of the, the first people in the field from Oxford uh, Oxford University, and he showed he took this pure FAPPI3. And the iodide is substituted in uh, bromide to actually get the uh, red edge to shift. So this is a pure perovskite to a MAPPI3. Or this is the methylmonium. We have bromide, bromide, bromide. You see the, uh, the band edge just continues to shift and shift in all the way to 550 nanometers from a grid of 800 nanometers. So photoluminescent shift here um, uh, as, as well. So this is a pure material, pure iodide, definitely pure bromide. And actually, there's a gap simply because there's one constitution, a few arranged constitutions of bromide that are completely unstable and falls apart. But no other semiconductor can do this. So if I want a green LED, a red LED, and a blue LED, I need three different semiconductors. In this case, I take one semiconductor, add a little bromine, and I got a different emission. Uh, it's really quite, quite fascinating how this material um, works. The other cool thing about perovskite is defect tolerance. So typically in semiconductors, you know. You've got um, silicon, right? And it's what, 10 to the seven, I'm oh, sorry, sorry, 10 to the seven, uh, seven nines fewer, so 99% point, point well, and seven more nines um, to be useful in a, in, a, uh, in a PV cell. So any of the, the defects or impurities inside have to be extremely low to be functional in, in a PV cell. And why is because you've got your valence band, your conduction band, the energy's right here, uh, the density of states. And so if I had a defect in a, a silicon material, Introduce what's called a deep state. So the gap is the, uh, the, the defect is inside of the gap uh, or the forbidden zone, meaning that um, uh, charges that are created in the PV process can get trapped in the states and um, the energy is then lost, right? But in perovskite, when you form these defects, these defects tend to lie at the band edges. So there's already a density of states here at the top of the valence band. So it just kind of falls in the density of states. It doesn't really cause any problems, right? Same here in the conduction. Um, so that's really quite quite unique among semiconductors um, as well. And this was demonstrated by a good friend of mine, Xerxes Stir, when he was there at NREL. He's a, a, he's a assistant professor now at Colorado School of Mines. And he used um, X-ray photo emission spectroscopy uh, to show that they're monitoring the uh, 4F, um, LED 4F um, orbital. And they show that you're losing um, signal, losing signal, losing signal, the ID signal, because ID is losing. Right, so they're, they're making the, the ID leave the prospect material. This is for methylmonium lead ID, MA. It's leaving, it's leaving, it's leaving, but the, um, uh, the valence band edge, it doesn't change until one sixth of the ID leaves, and then it starts to drop down kind of rapidly. So, meaning that I can have a density of one sixth, and so one sixth of all the X sites um, in the perovskite structure that I had shown previously. So, the X sites there on the faces of the octahedron. One sixth was to be missing, and it still is the same semiconductor, right? It still functions the same. Um, silicon could never, ever even dream of getting anywhere close to that, uh, even by the order of magnitude. So, 
that's a lot of stuff that's been done by by others. So us, so we function on a uh, function on a on a kind of thesis that you know we don't know everything. We don't know. We don't know. What we don't know is how the frostbite system works, right? So if it decomposes, why is it? Why does it decompose? How does it decompose? What's the mechanism? Um, if you have an efficiency problem, what what is that problem? What's the source of that problem? How is it generated? So we do a lot of fundamental research. And here we show, we start off, so nil means a pure perovskite material. So all the, all the sites, A, B, and X are all occupied. And then um, empathy here, negative uh, 60 MeV, we can actually lose an FAI uh, set. So it's, it's, it's an ionic pair, right? So I've got an iodide atom and then a form of an or FA um, cation. And so it's actually exothermic. You're actually losing energy, which means this thing is, is, uh, is good, right? And like it's, uh, it's, it's uh, possible uh, energetically, even around when the temperature is like, it take a lot of energy, right? Really some. But you can see this red line here, this is the nil, right? So this is the band structure uh, or density of states of the pure rocket material. We have this vacancy we created, it makes this little blue nub right here. But you can see that's the band edge of the peroxide production, and it falls right there on top of it, meaning it's not injecting any kind of uh, defect into the gap in between the valence band and the conduction band, which would form a charge trap on each state. Which would be problematic for efficiency. But what happens if you introduce extra? We're just talking about extra iodide uh, in your office, uh, David. So what happens if you introduce extra iodide? So take the same nil, so that's the pure perovskite material, and we introduce um, an iodide or an iodine in this case, an I two. Um, get to make some kind of assumptions when using density functional theory, as we're doing here. Um, we introduce this. You can actually form I three. Minus, so triiodide. And what's interesting, Sarah, you see the, the blue peak. So now we've actually introduced a, a state that's still close to the band edge, but now it's inside of the gap, uh, or, or at least part of the density of states is inside of the gap. So this is a bad thing. So if I just have FAI leave, no big deal. I'm missing FAI, that's bad. That's bad for stability, um, but it is an effective system electronically, like we showed in this study here with Xerxes Stir. Um, but another instance, if I do have a vacancy, um, what I created in the first slide, right? And then I add um, iodine, two, two iodide atoms, and create uh, an FA vacancy and a triiodide. Now that defect state is quite deep in the gap, and this is very problematic. So there are instances where we can create certain types of defects um, that can create mid gap states that can affect the performance. So why would I do this? Is maybe the question, right? So why, why do I care? So I know that if I lose, lose FAI, it's no big deal in terms of performance, you know, efficiency, not durability, but efficiency. But if I have vacancies and I have excess iodide and I form triiodide, now I got a problem. Now I'm gonna lose, uh, lose efficiency. So the grand challenge in perovskite is durability, as I mentioned previously, like efficiency is not hard. People are like 25% plus efficient perovskite solar cells now. Uh, CATTEL, which I mentioned, is commercialized. The maximum efficiency it's achieved is 22%. Silicon is around uh, 26 and a half or so. So perovskite is like right next to a material that's been under development for about 70 years. Um, so we knew that going in, durability was a key thing we had to address. It's a very efficient material. So we took two approaches. I mentioned already chemistry, so materials level durability, and then device level durability. So you got to build the right house with the right materials, the foundation, you know, build on the rock. That's really, really important. So there's four kind of uh, subcategories. That's the one composition that matters. Again, that's, the, that's specifically the chemistry, uh, the material, and there's inks. So as I mentioned in the tagline, you know, it's a, it's a printed material, right? So if you print something, what do you need by requisite? An ink, right? So you got to take the perovskite starting materials, convert those into an ink first. So there's chemistry, like, you know, uh, we we'll talk about like uh, like printer inks. We don't print stuff as much as we used to. We still print some things, but you know, color ink is like far more expensive than gold and platinum and blood and whatever. You know, it's extremely expensive plasma. Uh, it's really really expensive because of a lot of work that goes into the chemistry of the inks to make them print right, make the color you want, make it stick to the surface and not peel off and print cleanly and all that. A lot of effort goes into that. So same thing here. A lot of work on the ink chemistry. And then device architecture. So you got to put the right contact layers uh, directly uh, proximate to the perovskite specifically, um, so you don't have corrosion. You have good charge injection or extraction. Um, the whole thing stays together under stress. And then metrology and testing. Um, these are actually units we designed and built internally 
um, uh, at Hunt, well, previous, that it's, a, it's an automated system that shines light on the perovskite material and then does every few minutes does a, an ID test, an ID scan. So it tests the performance of the perovskite solar cell every few minutes under constant light uh, bombardment and then high temperature. So one sun, uh, which is 1,000 watts per meter squared of light intensity um, at 75 degrees Celsius. So this is a pretty, pretty nasty conditions to be under. And um, that's how we age ourselves. No one else does it that way. And so that's one way to dis differentiate it by stressing the perovskite cell really in, in kind of a kind of a nasty manner to make it fail as fast as possible. And we tear it apart, figure out how it failed, make some adjustments, try again. So metrology and testing have been really important to the process. So one of the things that we learned um, under damp heat conditions, so 85 degrees Celsius and 55% uh, relative humidity. So this is really nasty conditions. You open this big oven up and this massive thing of steam, hot steam hits you in the face. And so we have three different conditions here. So we have what we work on, the so-called two-step um, process, meaning you coat, so, so FAPBI3, you coat lead iodide first, and then you coat FAI second, apply some heat, you get a, we call it, it's called in situ reactions with two things react together on the surface and form the perovskite material. So it's two steps. Um, why two steps are important for us? Because it gives you kinetic control, right? So you have pure um, lead iodide on your surface and I coat it with FAI. So I can control the concentration of the FAI. Um, it's on the surface and that allows me to control how fast the reaction occurs. And that allows me to control how the process uh, or the perovskite itself um, crystallizes. And that determines the optoelectronic uh, properties. So what we can note here, number one is two-step, is our two-step formulation. And then five and seven are one-step formulations of two different concentrations of ink, 0.8 and one, uh, one molar. And then we take these bare, unprotected films, which most people working perovskites would know, why in the hell would you take an unprotected perovskite film, hope for it, and put it in a damp heat oven because it's just going to fall apart. Well, that's what the one step does. <laughs> so after about a week, it's mostly decomposed. Um, whereas the perovskite material um, kind of holds its color. Now you look at this one on the left hand or far right hand side, it does retain a little bit of color uh, at about 14 days. But let's break this down and look at the transmission spectroscopy and the photoluminescence. Um, we won't get much into the PL, but the spectroscopy here is really important where um, you can see the band edge absorption here around 800 nanometers. There is some shifting. What actually is happening is the perovskite is not decomposing. As you can see, the, the, um, there is some change here. So that's, that's forming lead iodide right there. But for most part, the perovskite is still there. There is some shifting around. Uh, part of its scattering effects, what actually happens to the perovskite under certain stress is it translates. So across the surface, it moves, and then it coalesces into mounds, and then it creates kind of spaces in between. So the perovskite is still there. Its constitution is still the same, but there's gaps in between, and that's why it looks lighter. So you're not losing perovskite, just its physical structure, not chemical structure, um, is changing. But so, so look at that for a second. You can see how similar all of the spectra are. So you start at zero hours in black and then um, 984 hours um, there in red, basically all the same. And then for the one step, you can see as it ages, the, um, the uh, transmission spectrum uh, drastically uh, changes down to the point where you have just pure lead iodide um, at, uh, 648 hours, and you're almost all the way there at 384 hours. Um, so just rapid decomposition, so that's 0.8 molar. And then you can slow it a little bit, this higher concentration. So basically higher concentration under the same deposition conditions means it's just thicker. So you have a greater mass. So just, you have more material. So it just takes longer with more material, but it still does the same thing in the same amount of time. So 648 hours, the perovskite is completely decomposed down to, uh, to lead iodide. So to contrast that, you might say, well, Michael, I see some motion. There are some things happening, but then you compare it to that. It's like, okay, all right, this is this is different. This is special. Another thing, give us a cool little set called Manton Par. It's a temperature controlled stage you put into an X-ray diffractometer. Uh, it goes to 500 Celsius. It's really neat, and it has you can control the atmosphere over it as well. In the case here, we have just the system open, so it's just atmosphere inside, and we're starting at uh, 50 degrees Celsius. That's the first uh, temperature measurement. And we are uh, taking the X-ray diffraction pattern of perovskite. So I don't know if you know much about X-ray diffraction, but just in case, you can look at the top here where it says alpha. That means perovskite, perovskite that we want. And then PBI2 is lead iodide, the composition part that I showed in the last slide, the yellow stuff. You don't want that. And so you start heating this thing up at around 135 Celsius. 
um, the lead iodide peak begins to grow in. Uh, it's around 12 degrees uh, to theta. And then this is bad, right? So 135 degrees Celsius is relatively low temperature. The frog sky is not very thermally stable. This is, a, this is a bad thing. So we came up with a specific additive. We tried many, many of them. Um, Find a little chemistry knowledge, kind of narrow that down. And then do the same experiment. And this is, I think, uh, over, um, I think this is 75 minutes. So it's a relatively long um, experiment uh, as well. And you can see go all the way up to about 200, you know, 195 Celsius um, before you start getting any significant lead iodide um, signal. So you go from this, I put in an additive to this. Huge change. And now we have really robust thermal stability, you know, relative to perovskite anyway, uh, as compared to some of the more common compositions out there, even the pure FAPBI3 without this little bit of additive. So on durability in a device, um, so that's, that's kind of a different situation. So on a device, you got the perovskite in the middle, then I have all these contact layers too. So I have all these other things that can decompose along with the perovskite, which is kind of bad, right? This gets into engineering where uh, I can make the perovskite as great as I want, but if I got a really terrible whole selective layer, whole transport layer, it decomposes, then the device fails, and it looks like, and it just looks bad for perovskite. It's got to have robust contact layers over that rock that I mentioned. So this is, I've actually never shown this in public before. This is a pretty interesting um, plot. So we do a lot of data science um, in our, our group as well. And so this is an experiment over the course of um, not quite two years. Um, so we use that degradation system I showed on, on the earlier slides. Um, so we're heating at once, you know, 75C, one sun, constant bombardment, always on condition for the perovskite cell, the open circuit voltage, which is the worst setting versus short, short circuit or max power point. Um, Conditions, open circuits, the most corrosive to the perovskite device. And so on the right hand bar here, kind of like a heat map type thing, uh, it shows the efficiency of the cell. So you can line up the color of the color in the bar and get an idea. So the goal of this experiment is to have 80% and really in reality 90% or greater of your original power um, after a thousand hours. So say it starts out, say, making 20 milliwatts, right? Um, I need to make at least 16 milliwatts per centimeter squared after a thousand hours. That would be 80% power retention, or even higher, 18% at 90% power retention, which is favored. And you can see, so this thousand hours, this high temperature is very, very difficult to achieve. There's the thousand hours there. You can see most of our data points are all up to around 500 hours or so, which is, which is pretty robust. Um, but we got a nice smattering of data points up there. Um, beyond, if you get a few beyond 3,000 hours. Um, so this is a quite robust cell that we've built. So I've taken all these learnings of how to make the perovskite more thermally efficient or more thermally durable, um, durable to, to, uh, to humidity as well, and then put it to a strong architecture um, device stack to get some relatively high efficiencies um, uh, and very um, robust durability numbers. And that's a little video of the perovskite boiling in water. And the perovskite is uh, purple in color. If it decomposes, it'll turn, it'll turn yellow. So we can't just do um, device tests um, over and over and over again because it's a thousand hours. That's actually six weeks worth of work. Right, so this thing has to sit for six weeks before I can confirm it's passed the test. So a lot of chemical things, spectroscopic things you can do. And so perovskite again is ABX3 that we showed in the original model. So if you have a substoichiometric composition, meaning you have less AX than you're supposed to towards BX2, so that's pure lead iodide, versus a super stoichiometric composition, we have excess AX um, all the way to pure AX. So that would, in this case, you would have for FAPBI3, I have, I have too much FAI versus um, lead iodide. And substoichiometrics, I don't have enough FAI to lead iodide. And we can actually monitor both of those conditions spectroscopically. So here on the left, we are doing admittance spectroscopy. So we're looking at um, frequency versus uh, uh, capacitance. So at the low frequency capacitance here in this plot, you see this, this rising um, of signal from around what, 80 um, nanofarads per centimeter square up to about 200. So as you go up in capacitance, it's chemical capacitance at low frequency, meaning you have more ions moving around inside the perovskite material. And the more it moves around, because you have too much. You have a balanced amount of ABX3, the ions will still move. Um, but not very much, particularly in the dark, as this is measured. Uh, but if you have too much AX, then the ions move around um, you know, quite, quite easily, right? You can see that as the composition goes up, 
the response goes up. So we know that the blue line here down the bottom, if I make a cell out of this, um, or actually this is a cell, excuse me, I test durability on this cell, it's gonna be way more robust than the pink one. So that's an early indicator we developed. The second thing is what we call the lead iodide shadow. So this is external quantum efficiency. So this tells the efficiency of monochromatic light conversion into, into power. And um, in the case, also kind of a similar condition here, it's a, I know the colors match, but it's different devices. Um, this is a substoichiometric here on the right versus superstoichiometric on the left. Um, but we have what should be a normal perovskite spectrum here, kind of the pinkish colors I just pointed out. Um, this blue one here though, is uh, substoichiometric. It doesn't have enough um, FAI or the AX, uh, so it has too much lead iodide. And the lead iodide uh, absorbs in this region, so it's actually blocking the light um, from getting to the perovskite material. Um, so if it blocks the light, and the light, light can't be converted to electricity, and so I can't measure electrical signal in the quantum efficiency measurement. Uh, and so I know the same condition that uh, this blue one will fail in a device far before this pink or red one. So again, nice, cool, early indications of, of uh, device stability. Um, another thing we did was environmental XPS. So X-ray photoemissions, which Oscar mentioned earlier, um, but it's in a, it's kind of a, a high pressure chamber. So meaning XPS is usually measured like 10 to minus six or so torr. Um, I can backfill that with oxygen or water, about 10 to minus three torr, and see how the perovskite surface chemistry changes with exposure to these materials. Um, and of course, the X-ray flux of the measurement tool. And so you can see here in this plot, we have a lead to iodide ratio of 3.8 to one. So again, it should be three to one. So three iodides for, uh, for every lead, eight index three. Um, but if you look at the signal, so the main signal we're looking for is the FAI peak, as it has indicated here, so the blue. So this is, this is pure prospect here as we start. And then over time, exposure to, uh, to the X-ray flux, uh, the perovskite decomposes, right? So changes from perovskite material to not perovskite material and lead zero. So the perovskite contains lead and the lead uh, is in two plus oxidation state. And as it decomposes, it turns into lead zero or lead metal um, through a redox process. And so you can see there's a little bit of lead zero at the beginning. Actually, there's none, it's at zero. And then as it's exposed to the X-ray flux, and it can draw it. But now we have 2.8 to 1, so near stoichiometric, a little sub stoichiometric, but, but almost stoichiometric. Same conditions, the blue line, the cross light maintained. And there is a little bit of lead zero pro in, but nothing as compared to here. This is really, really quickly, whereas this is quite robust relative to the So stoichiometry is really important uh, to the perovskite material. And we believe, I mentioned earlier uh, in the, uh, the modeling, so this is where the modeling meets the empirical work. So we're, we're demonstrating here or trying to prove that actually uh, this triiodide formation is, is causing the perovskite to, uh, the perovskite to decompose. Um, and so that's part of our theory that we have in this ACS Energy Letters uh, paper. Now, kind of getting, you know, we started pretty scientific, very fundamental. Now we're gonna go straight engineering. Um, so to make a perovskite solar cell or a perovskite module, there's a lot of ways to coat or to print um, solutions, right, or, or inks. And, um, you know, most of us that are in the perovskite world, we start off spin coating, we spun coat our, our OPVs or organic photovoltaics once upon a time. And then we transition internally um, at, at Hunt um, to blade coating. So our, they call it Dr. Blade, this image here. But basically you take a, a flat surface and an ink, and you push that ink across the surface with the blade. So that works kind of well. Um, it actually can be um, scaled, so this is a scalable technique. But there's another technique we like much, much more, it's called slot die coating. Um, and that's what I'm gonna show in these following slides. Um, it's quite simple, it's an added manufacturing tool. So if you look at a 3D printer, the concept of 3D printing, as we know, if you buy a, a, a maker mark or whatever, it's all these things, um, it's an extrusion process, right? So you have a plastic filament, heat it up in a head, and squeeze it out a little bit whole little orifice, right? Make your little widget, whatever you want to make. Kind of same thing, but it's a long, thin opening like this, and you squeeze the perovskite material out. Um, that slots I coat. And kind of demonstrate this kind of step by step. How is it formed? Um, one thing first here. So P one two three. This is this is kind of important. So you start off these continuous layers. So you have your hole selective layer, your perovskite layer, and your electron selective layer. And this all started off continuous, right? So it's just flat layers. Well, what I want to do when I convert from solar cells into modules, 
I need to be able to take a, a flat piece of cross that continues to be square cross that material and section up individual strips to make uh, small narrow cells that are uh, individual and they connect in series to make a full size module. I'll show some more on that later. But the most important thing is, is you take your conductive material first and you put a stripe mark in and separate it into two different pieces. We call that P1 stripe. And then you have to cut a hole uh, or a, a slice, really, um, through the prospect stack, through the full selected prospect and the selected material. This big opening here, then you deposit metal on top of that. That metal then goes through here, connects the metal on top of the back electrode to the front electrode. And then I do one more stripe, that's the SD2, um, that separates all this stack from this stack. So now I have two individual cells. So this is the cell, and this is the electrical connection. This is the cell, this is the electrical connection, and it's all in series. So it's PDN, PDN, PDN. So it's, it's in series. So in series, we add voltage uh, versus parallel, you add uh, current. So we start off with a piece of conductive glass. Um, you print um, the whole selective contact. I'm sorry. Start off with a piece of uh, conductive glass. You scribe a P1 mark that I mentioned first. So right, right there. Um, and then I cross or, uh, uh, slot die coat the whole selective contact, which is the pink right there. Um, then I slot die coat the cross material. I heat it. And then I slot die coat the electron selective contact. And then I scribe the P2 here. And then I deposit a metal electrode, which is kind of shown here, already sliced up. But then I scribe it and uh, make the P3 contact. So each one of these individual strips here is a long, skinny uh, solar cell. And why you make them long and skinny is uh, electron transport, or the, the whole uh, electrical um, circuit goes this direction. So one electrode is here. So let me call it E and then E prime. Over here, so electrode one and electrode two. So the, the energy of electrons flow from, from E to E prime in this case. And so what you're doing going through this kind of series of serially connected um, solar cells, you want to have a minimum path length through the conductor uh, because on top in this instance, I have metal, which is very conductive. On the bottom, I have a transparent conducting oxide, which is much less conductive than the metal. And so you start losing your energy to resistive losses. And so you want to make the solar cells as skinny as possible, so that way you have a minimum uh, resistive losses. And so you put all that in practice. Uh, this is this is pretty cool. I actually haven't shown this is pretty new, like a couple weeks old. Um, it was kind of hot off the press. And so those scribe marks, as I showed in the previous slide, end up here. You see light transmission through. So this is a, a lit stage in the back of just a, a camera on top, taking an optical image um, of the cell. And here's the photoluminescent image. So your so those LEDs there are photo exciting the prospect material, and then we're taking a picture of the photo emission. So bright areas, and then I was talking about photo emission is good. <laughs> so so bright PL is a good thing, dark PL emission is a bad thing. And what you can see, so this is kind of the original layout that I showed in the previous slide. You have all the cells connected in series. Um, but what happens is if I have a bad area, say like right here or something, but all of this on the other end of the strip, this is one long cell, right? Um, the whole thing goes dark, right? So one defect maybe down here causes the whole cell to go, go dark, those emissions is as bad as decreases efficiency. So we can actually add one more scribe. So kind of the same demonstration here. So this is a P1, 2, and 3 kind of all contained in the one little slice that's all P1, 2, and 3, P1, 2, and 3, P1, 2, and 3. P1, 2, and 3. I can add a perpendicular stripe called a P4 stripe, and that's three, right? But what you can see is if I have a bad area, then it becomes isolated. Right? So I got a dark spot here, but above it, this prospect's going pretty bright, and up here, this is going even brighter, right? So, so I actually have these conductive pathways that can make good electricity where I have a real problem with this one individual um, subcell inside of the module. So this P4 stripe allows for isolation of bad areas and increases the efficiency. Now, uh, the last thing, oh, oh, I totally missed the, uh, this should covered up. So the efficiency number is where we're at. So this, this current design, this current design is 26 cells all in series. They're four and a half by 130 uh, millimeters. So 130 millimeters long, four and a half wide. And then the sub modules for the P4 scrapping is 25 millimeters, producing more than 26 volts. So that's more than one volt uh, per cell, which is great. Greater than a 70% 70, 70 flow factor, which is really solid considering all those resistive losses that I mentioned earlier. 
and greater than 20 milliamps per centimeter squared for a maximum efficiency of 14.6%. Um, and so uh, there are some numbers higher than this out there. Um, but this is pretty cool because we've made our first module of this size about eight weeks ago now. So we went from 5% eight weeks ago to 14 and a half percent uh, in about two months. So the progression rate is pretty, pretty solid. So I can keep my team going. We'll get somewhere special real soon. So this is a, just some really fantastic progress. I can't brag about my team uh, enough. I'm actually lucky to be part of it. So what are we going to do with this? This is all right. perfect. Um, we're going to make uh, a tandem device. So what is a tandem device? So I've got, again, a wide band gap semiconductor, a narrow band gap semiconductor. Um, you can either make one directly on top of the other. So I've got the, the low band gap and I can coat or deposit the, the wide band gap directly on top, the two terminal device, or I can take low band gap, wide band gap, and then mechanically stack them as a four terminal device. There's some kind of contrast between the two. You know, if you coat directly on top of, like, say, silicon, you coat perovskite on silicon, you can have these chemical interactions between the two and cause a problem, right? Silicon is also textured, so they purposely make it very, very rough because silicon is very reflective, and so you lose a lot of your energy reflection. So you can see purposely texture it with usually potassium uh, hydroxide, and also this carbon black version, which is RA, I'm sorry, silicon black, or they use RAE etching. Um, but either way, you got a you textured surface. So I got this really rough textured surface, and I want to coat a five, you know, it's micron, you know, level roughness, and I want to coat 500 nanometers of frost material on top. This is not a good problem. Right? This is not, not a good idea. Well, with a four terminal, I can make the two cells completely independent of one another and mechanically stack them. Well, you know, you may think to yourself, that's extra work. Why would you want to do that? It's just to make it cost more. Well, the entire industry, PV industry, is moving towards a, a bifacial cell. A bifacial uh, cell or module, what that means is I got two pieces of glass uh, sandwiching a silicon solar cell that. And because of glass on both sides, and then the cell is designed such that it has uh, a transparent uh, uh, front and back, right? So I can collect light from the front, which is normal, right? The sun shines on the solar panel, but also the light hits the ground. If someone's around the panels, going through the panels, the sides of the panels, that light hits the ground and reflects up and hits the back side of the cell. That's called albedo light. So albedo means reflection in, in uh, black. And so you have this flint of light on the back side of the cell, which normally does nothing. But I get bifacial, I can actually collect light from both sides. And that creates more, more energy density, right? So I talked about power earlier. So now I have two sources of light instead of one source, so I can actually create more energy. So the other thing that's really important is um, because it's four terminal um, versus two terminals, if I have two things directly linked to one another, I only have two options. I can directly connect them uh, parallel. So that's adding the currents together. So current of cell A and the current of cell B. Or I can, I'm sorry, uh, serial. <laughs> so parallel is current. Um, or I can add a series we add voltage. So I'm sorry. Um, and so you have to have one or the other. They have to be interconnected either parallel or serial. Before terminal, you can actually have four terminuses, right? So I have one cell that's on, um, it's uh, functioning independently of the other cells, so two terminals uh, for each. I can have independent power electrons that contain the same box. Um, so I don't have to worry about matching currents or matching voltages. So, so why is it important that I don't have to match in one scenario and I have to match in the other scenario? So if you look at the band gap of the uh, bottom cell versus the band gap of the top cell, and so for us, that should be already is 1.5 E right here. Um, silicon is 1.1 E. And so you see there's an overlap right here. So this is this uh, bright yellow, bright green. This is good, it's high efficiency, as shown here in the bar, the legend. So up to 45% efficiency is this theoretical max, not, not achievable, just theoretical on paper maximum. So you have this overlap here that requires you to get 1.7 EV um, for the prospect, which will be top cell. I go a little bit above or below, you can see it turns dark very, very quickly. Well, the four terminal, look at this. Now I've got one big gigantic blue or green spot in the middle. So if I'm stuck with silicon, I can't change that. I have to sub silicon back cell. I'm good, at least within this ridge here, these rings, um, from 1.6 up to about 1.9 EV. I have 0.3 EV um, that I can modulate the band gap of the cross band material and uh, attain a really high efficiency um, um, tandem uh, module. And so I just to emphasize that a little bit further, 
I have maximum efficiency here and a top cell band gap here on the next axis. You can see it's quite broad for the four terminal because the cells can um, operate independently versus the serially or uh, parallel connection devices. You have I see it has to be at 1.7 you can get the cross here on top, or you can't get that maximum efficiency. You quickly trail off in both in both directions, which has some complications I won't get into today. Um, but it but it is it does make it complicated that drop off. And so my last slide here. Um, so our goal is to make four terminal tanks. Um, that goal came about in the merger on June 24th. Uh, so just a few months ago. So I was only working on single junction cells up until then. Um, so now we're working on four terminal. The big difference between single junction and four terminal is the backside now needs to be transparent. So light needs to, be able to go through it. And a regular single junction in the metal electrode is reflected. So light will come in, some of it will get absorbed, some hits the back electrode, gets reflected back, and it's a second chance of absorption. Um, with a, uh, with a uh, uh, tandem device, the light that's not absorbed needs to go straight through the top cell, strike the bottom cell, and then in one case or the other, the top cell, the bottom cell get converted into electricity. So transparency of the top cell is really, really important. So we go from a metal electrode, like we show here, um, to a transparent electrode, like we showed here. So these are really small, six, uh, six millimeters squared. Um, and this one here, this is also a transparent cell um, at uh, one centimeter squared. So this is kind of the minimum accepted value for the so-called NREL National Renewable Energy uh, Laboratory uh, famous PV efficiency chart. You have to be at least one centimeter squared to get on that chart. Um, so our uh, devices now, so the control of the reflective electrode is 19%. Um, and then the small area, uh, this is not our perovskite uh, composition, by the way, our is quite higher. But um, with a transparent back contact, TBC, um, it's at 17.4%. And you combine this with a silicon cell, that data is not shown here. Um, the silicon cell is actually now filtered. So everything that's, uh, in this case, about 1.6 EV, um, band gaps are 1.6 EV energy and higher is all absorbed by the prop type material. And everything below that um, gets transmitted in silicon. And so it gets a lot less light than normal wood with a single junction um, uh, configuration. But that goes from about a 21% efficient uh, silicon cell to about 6% mechanically stacked. So you add the two together. So we got about 20, uh, 23.4%. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, it's 6.6. .6. So that's a uh, 24% um, four terminal tank. And again, this, this whole part of the project is about a month old. So we had 0% PCE because we never made a transparent device uh, a month ago. And now we're up to a 17.4% you know, with a 6.6% um, contribution from the silicon back cell. So we're making some pretty good progress uh, at a pretty good, uh, pretty good rate. So thank you all for your attention. I know that was probably a lot. Um, I didn't know exactly the audience, so I just kind of covered a broad range. Maybe understood part of it, not all of it. I don't know. But I'm here for questions. I can clarify whatever you like. But thank you for your attention. Um, mechanically stacked design, are you setting it up so that you can take off the coral sky and replace it at some time interval, or is it going to be? Yeah. It may be in principle you could, but they're going to be glued together with a laminate, and so you probably would destroy the bottom cell in the process. But ideally, we're going to make the prostate cell last as long as the silicon cell, so it won't be necessary. That's the goal. So. You just talk about this, but I saw something we've, we've relegated. Um, so ITO's got uh, some defects, some, some surface problems. And so we found, uh, before we cut them, we don't use them anymore, so why not? Uh, we found that uh, if you coated nickel oxide on perovskite, you have these defects at the ITO surface, and that caused uh, an interfacial issue between the two materials. And so if you put uh, this very thin aluminum layer in between the two, it passivated the ITO surface without really causing any extra tear resistance. He had a much uh, better interface than nickel oxide and the NCO. He had higher performance in the device. So, um, probably. Um, I don't know. Wow. Well, the NCO uh, now. So, the big secret in this whole uh, laser scrubbing business. So, we make these modules. Um, so, we're cutting with a laser. 
cutting of a laser to make these uh, these scribe marks. And um, FTO, so fluorine doped tin oxide, uh, can be scribed quite cleanly. So you're just lasers passing through. I can make a nice, thin, clean line. Which I do with ITO, it, uh, it splatters so, so that the debris like flies everywhere and falls back into the cut, falls into the side, makes everything rough. You can't really try ITO very well. Can, but it's just it's not very clean. So we switch to FTO, so it makes serial uh, makes serial markers. So that's secret longer used. Yes. So in silicon, it's it's pretty straightforward, right? The silicon is an indirect uh, band gap semiconductor, right? So like the two two energy wells have uh, different momentums, right? So you apply uh, phononic you know, phonons, right? Those things start to separate, uh, and so they line between the two wells to the band of conduction, and the band then becomes less, and you start losing the voltage, right? Uh, and so for you don't have have that issue. You know, it's more of a uh, you know it's more like a molecular system. Uh, that's when I showed it there in the beginning. And so I, I can't explain exactly why it has such a good um, conduction band. I'm um, sorry, such a good uh, thermal coefficient. But just the assumption that these uh, these wells they don't they don't move in the same way. Um, so people have even said that maybe the valence band is actually this valence band is split potentially. I've seen some people proposing that. Um, and so we don't exactly understand the electronic structure completely, which is why we did quantum uh, in physics. I mentioned this earlier in a talk that. Uh, there is IC between engineering and, and science. It's like an engineer has a, nuts, a bunch of known quantities. They got to figure out how to apply them effectively, right? And, and creatively. So you got a toolbox full of tools. It's got to know which tool to apply which problem and how to use the tool. But if the tool doesn't exist, that's where science comes in. So design the tool and, and make the tool and then put the tool in the toolbox, right? So uh, in our case, we're missing a lot of tools. <laughs> so we can't engineer the device the way it needs to be engineered because we just don't know enough. And so that's actually a really great question. That's something we need to learn more about fundamentally why uh, we have that that difference. But yeah, this is a small area. So the caveat is, is that as it scales a larger area, we might lose this effect to some extent. Uh, we just don't know that. Yet. But right now, it's very, very, very promising. So starting in the right position. All of that. Oh, there's coefficient? Yeah, so so uh, cat tail is about the same uh, as silicon. Um, so the latest version of uh, of the cat tail, I think, is a little bit better. Um, so they, they have a new one they're called Pure. Um, a new version of series they're called Pure. It's got a, a lower energy coefficient, or lower numerical uh, not actually that um, coefficient. So, um, um, so the same, same thing. Um, I, I'm not a cat tail expert. I don't know why it's high as silicon. Yes, ma'am. Would you mind? I can't. That's a great question. Yeah, it is. So, so fundamentally, yeah, if we had a, a, a you know, if we stuck with our current perovskite layer, which is far from perfect. It's good. It's better than most, but it's got a long way to go to be right. Um, we could continue to scribe. There's another factor that I did not mention. Uh, I didn't want to really get into it, but that's an excellent question to bring it up. So when I calculate efficiency right now, um, I cheat a little bit. I, what I'm saying efficiency is the cell efficiency. What's the efficiency of this cell and this cell? Right. But if you look, there's gaps in between. That is that is producing power. So if I go and sell this thing, um, you have what's called module efficiency, right? So I calculate module efficiency. I have to calculate with the whole entire area of the module, right? We don't do that now because there's a 10 millimeter board all the way around to go to seal the top piece of glass, the bottom piece of glass, um, to make this hermetically sealed, which would be the way they make a, a panel for for the commercial purposes we sell it. That 10 millimeter board doesn't scale. Meaning that with a full size panel that borders 10 millimeters, if it's 150 millimeters, it's still 10 millimeters, right? So, so to really kind of focus in on how just the, the cells themselves are being improved over time, we, we focus just on the area inside of the, uh, of, of the, of the frame. And so, um, what that means is 
is that the more peroxide I cut away, the more dead area I create. That's the geometric cofactor. So if 100% geometric cofactor would mean the whole thing is, is, is active, right? Uh, but in this configuration right here, about 89% geometric cofactor. And you add P4, so I create more dead area here. I blade away, block at zero. So now this is like 8, 8 7, something like that percent geometric cofactor. So the more uh, perpendicular scribe I would add, the geometric cofactor would go down and down and down. And so ultimately, the efficiency of the cells might actually go up. The power output of the module would go down. Yeah, just but the problem is, is the recombination pathways is multiple, right? And so in a good cell like this, you want high efficiency, right? So you, you want any, this is under open circuit conditions. So you want every um, uh, photon that's absorbed that creates an excited state and a cold electron pair. They have more to go, they can't be collected. So you just want them to recombine and then photo them. That's, that's ideal, right? Um, but, you know, there's some arguments like saying, that it's, I don't believe, by the way, but, you know, it's better whole, you know, collection layer will get injected, but there's no circuit, so it's not possible. Um, and so uh, we have actually seen this as well. We, we found some that are less photomissive than others that have higher performance. Um, so it's actually a really good question that we're actively investigating. Just what it's, right? but, but better photomission, um, just based on the principles, would only be uh, better. Yeah, so I mean, if you're looking at photomission like this instance, the way I just described it, if you're looking at just the quality of the prospect material, right? But you've got, like I showed earlier, the stack, you've got multiple layers involved. And, um, you know, interfacial engineering is a big part of uh, fit film PV. And so, uh, if I can click to that quickly. Uh, I think actually this, yeah, on this previous slide here. Perfect. So why does absorb here in the process semiconductor? Creates electron hole pair. Electron needs to go this way. I'm sorry. Yeah, electron needs to go that way. And then uh, hole goes that way. Right. And so if the um, energetics between the perovskite semiconductor and the whole uh, collection layer, selective layer, they're not exactly aligned, right? Then you've got a, uh, perhaps a resistive, right? Or, or charge collection barrier you have to overcome. That'll cause you to lose power. Um, sometimes you get an interfacial dipole and the electron energy levels start to move around and things are lost. Um, sometimes, like in this case here, um, so the light comes in from the bottom, right? So you're creating most of your charge carriers in the first few nanometers of the perovskite material. And so uh, you're creating all these electrons and all these holes right next to the whole selective contact. So the whole selective contact's got a lot of work because it needs to collect all these holes as fast as it can collect them, but not collect any of the electrons. So that's why I like to call it a hole selective layer, because um, you want to collect just the holes and collect them efficiently and reject the electrons and force them on this field you created to go back to the electron selective contact and be collected by the collected electron in a single junction design. And so if you're collecting electrons at the front, that'll also reduce, uh, creates a second diode or reduce your VOC. Uh, and also it's annihilation, so you reduce your JSC. Probably looks like leakage. Um, and so there's a lot of ways for a solar cell to suck. Um, this is just not just a photo emission. Um, so a lot of ways to go wrong. That's so hard. Does that answer your question? 
Yes, sir. So you showed that the degradation rate uh, is much lower for a few staffing for calibration matter. Mm -hmm. And you said that you can control the kinetic and the crystallization uh, by doing that. So right. What the you know main mechanism? Why it's you know why it's degraded slower, much slower than the one step. Yeah. So um, I think that there's a lot of answers there. Um, the simple answer is a lot of what has to do with broad strike durability comes down to two things, geometry and excite occupation. And so the way you create the broad strike, like I mentioned, we made pure FAPPI3. It's in a cubic structure, PM3 bar uh, in itself. Uh, what happens generally is that unit cell is not stable and it instantly polymorphs into a hexagonal structure. Once it's hexagonal, it's no longer broad strike, right? It's no longer PD active. It's, it's what we call a delta phase and it's garbage, right? So this is what most people make when they're trying to make pure FAPPI3. However, if I allow everything to assemble correctly and form a nice, perfectly cube with the right uh, uh, lattice parameter, the proper one, we could be calculating the proper one, in the right lattice parameters, so it's got the right unit cell volume, the thing just seems to stay, right? And so you can control the rate of crystallization and how all those unit cells form, and then also the defect structure. So there's actually two ways to make the broadcast material. So solution processing, what we do, and vapor deposition. Um, a lot of people like vapor deposition, uh, but it's easy, there's no solvents. Um, the problem is you're doing, there's some tricks to it that you want to get into. But the biggest issue that I've discovered is the defect structure can form in the perovskite material, because the perovskite can't be doped, really. It's this intrinsic doping, right, via excite vacancy. And so um, you get the right excite vacancy uh, structure, right, defect structure in the solution process, just serendipitously. Like, no one really planned for that, it just happened. But when you do it by vapor deposition, you don't form the right structure. So the efficiency is so much lower because the perovskite uh, photophysical properties are always less than that of the solution process version. But having the right excite uh, defect structure, um, vacancy structure, that's super critical uh, as well. So the combination of those two things, um, because when you have too much excite vacancy, that relies, allows you to have defects that, that stressors become like water can come in, penetrate, cause them to fall apart. So you have just the right defects, the amount of defects that you get electron properties, but not too many make it not durable. That balance is something we can achieve through the kinetic control. Well, I realize we're starting to starting to push the, the time limits in the evening, and so I want to be respectful of, of people's time. But uh, I think uh, Dr. Roman will be up here for a little bit. So if you didn't get a chance to ask your question uh, now, uh, please feel free to, to come up and, and try and catch him at the end before we take him off to dinner. Uh, so uh, please join me in thanking uh, Michael for a really wonderful talk. Exactly. I'm not sure the audience. So. No, no. I think you. I think you did right. So pretty much everybody does that. And you. You always. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, 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 I sort of oscillate between the 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 too much. You, uh, every talk is always too basic for some fraction of the audience and too advanced for the other fraction of the audience. Right, right. But if you can, right. if you can do that, so that the people who knew nothing about, right, there, are, there are people here in this course that have. Uh, <laughs>